Well, praise the Lord, everyone. We greet you in the precious name of Jesus one more time, and thank you for being with us on another Wednesday night Bible class. We thank God for his grace and mercy and faithfulness to us. Right before we do anything, we want to pray and remember all of you that are streaming and there's multitudes on our prayer list and we want for those that have uh, been ill and recovering from various ailments as well as those who have lost their jobs and, and are having uh, some struggles. We're praying for them and we're praying for our children and their anxieties and the various things that are transpiring mentally as well as physically, that God will sustain us at this very hour. I certainly ask you to pray for me because I'm I surely want to be an inspiration to you. So let's look to the Lord. Father God, on this night, we thank you for allowing us to be gathered together one more time. You told us to do everything by prayer and supplication, making our requests request known unto you with thanksgiving. Knowing, Lord God, that you know our down sittings and our uprisings, you are acquainted with all of our ways, and we know that you have a remedy for every situation we find ourselves in, and you are our comforter, our solace, our strength, our refuge. So we honor you tonight, Lord. We will never chide you or complain. We'll just give your name the thanks. Names that we haven't called, but you know where they are. I'm asking you, Lord God, that you would meet them at their needs. And then, Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the family of God. Thank you for our young people that are graduating from college and high school and various uh, technological schools and not able to have the type of ceremonies they desired, but we thank you for allowing them to accomplish what they have accomplished. And now tonight, Father, as your servant goes to your word, you know that he desires to rightly represent you Please give me the mind, the understanding to deliver to your people for it's your desire that the flock that you purchased with your own blood be fed on the word of God and give me the ability to rightly divide it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. and. Once again, thank you for tuning in. Before I go any further, I do want to thank you. And whoever you are out there, whoever you are, that put that beautiful display in front of my house today for my birthday. I don't know who you are, but it's just gorgeous. And uh, all my neighbors know now that I'm 73 years old. And uh, even though my birthday actually is tomorrow, but I want to thank you. It's just beautiful. And uh, there's no way in the world for me to have a clear conscience eating all those jelly beans that are in my front yard. But thank you for thinking of me. And uh, that's very kind of you. Uh, tonight, I'm going to share with you a particular thought. And I want to be very transparent with you. I've been really wrestling uh, with the scriptures. What I mean by that, uh, if you know anything about me, I am bent on rightly dividing the word. And I will always tell you when it's my opinion, and then I'll tell you when it's the word of God. Because there are things in the word of God that are not clearly brought out. So we speculate. And the late Bishop Paddock said, when it comes down to speculation, we all can speculate. But I hope that I have the mind of God to 
give you the correct information that will be of some comfort to you in these times. We're well aware that we're in unprecedented times. The waters that we're sailing on are uncharted. And we're witnessing so many things that are transpiring in the human race. And whether you're saved in the body of Christ or not saved, we all are suffering to a degree. Thank God if we're in the household of faith, the church, we do have a hope that's beyond this world. But due to the circumstances of this pandemic that has uh, altered living in 212 countries, it's affected uh, the medical field, the political field, culturally, uh, our everyday activities, the things we love to do, our families, our children, our colleges. It has disrupted everything uh, looked like known to man. <clears throat> and the anxiety is very, very high. In fact, I've been reading about, no doubt, the increase of mental uh, anguish and illness and I had, had no idea it's the number one thing that keeps people at home. Uh, being, uh, feeling ill is a uh, mental uh, attack. And so many are committing suicide and alcoholism and various other things to try to soothe themselves because of the fear and the hysteria and out of their norm and what's gonna be next. and. I just want to address to you a couple of thoughts and then I want to share with you what the Word of God has to say. And I'll start off by saying none of this has caught God by surprise. All of this God is well aware of and His purpose and plan will be worked out. As far as the church is concerned, uh, I believe that God, according to his word, promised us he would never leave us nor forsake us. He will always be there for us, and I'm trusting that he is my refuge. But I want to say tonight concerning the moment that we're in, and, and one of the things I've been wrestling with is uh, what we call the rapture of the church or the catching away. We know that no man knows the day nor the hour when the revelation of Jesus Christ will take place, but we know it will take place. Now, we're not speculating on that part. We know that that's the absolute. What we don't know is the moment of the imminent return of the Lord. We don't know if it's tonight or a thousand nights from the night, but we do know it will take place because God has said so. So if you'll just bear with me a little while, I'm going to call your attention to a few portions of God's word. And also I'll have my chart drop down a little bit lower because I want to uh, mention a particular few points on it that you can take in your notes and study for yourself. When you look back over here and to my, to my right, these are things that have already transpired. We can look back into uh, the Old Testament and get an understanding of the origin of man, the origin of the world, uh, the people of Israel, the, the dispensations that have transpired. So far, there have been uh, five dispensations that have come to an end. Uh, the last one being the dispensation of law. And that particular dispensation ended with our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. He died for our sins. And then we go over into the church age. So we know about what has happened in the past, but now we're wondering about sequences of events that are gonna happen in the future. 
We know that our Lord has already paid the price for our salvation at Calvary and his death paid for our sins. And surely we are positive that he died, buried, and rose again. We also, many of us have had the marvelous experience right here of receiving the descent of the Holy Ghost. God, after uh, Jesus had gone back to heaven, he sent back the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. And for these 2,000 years, our Lord has been building himself a church. And this church is made up predominantly of Gentiles, but it's also mixed with Jews. And we know something about church history because we live in 2020. We know uh, some of the things, many of the things that took place during the times of the apostles, the missionary journeys, how the church went through the dark ages. And we know <clears throat> things that took place uh, when we came out of the dark ages and we have our Bible and we can read and what have you. And then we come to know that it's been 2,000 years and there are things that are said about the church uh, where we are right now, amen, that I'm going to go to tonight. Here at the end of the church age, once again, all these dispensations in the past ended in judgment. And our dispensation will end in judgment, and that will be the time of what we know as the tribulation. On this chart, tribulation takes up quite a bit of the chart, but really it's a seven-year period. Where we are right now, we're looking for the harvest of the church, the dead that are in Christ, and the live which are remaining right now. This is what I want to say something about right now. For 2,000 years, the church has been waiting for the Lord to come back. The Bible is clear that when he comes back, he will bring those that died in him, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him. And we are of the persuasion, I am one of those who believes he will not subject us to this seven-year period of tribulation, uh, which is going to be man's most horrific day of testing. And it's going to test the entire world. And at the end of it, it's going to be the restoration of Israel and will get its national promise. But once again, right now, I'm concerned about where we are right now and what's taking place. So I'm going to call your attention in your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And the Bible reads like this in verse number 8. Concerning our God, who will also confirm you to the end... I believe that's the end of the church age, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will sustain us. He will keep us. And then we're depending on God's faithfulness. God is faithful by whom you were called. I was called, you were called to his eternal glory into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we believe that God is going to confirm us, that he is going to keep us, and we will be found blameless. And I do believe that. Blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Surely he's going to reveal himself again. And one of the reasons why I'm so certain of that, the Bible guarantees it. Found in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 2, verse number one, 21, it says, Now he who establishes us with you 
in Christ has anointed us is God. We've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We received our anointing from Messiah and we've been baptized into the body of Christ. He has sealed us and he has given us his spirit that we would have a guarantee concerning things to come. There is so much that is to come in the not too distant future. I bring this up tonight because we are wrestling with this pandemic, uh, this corona, uh, coronavirus 19, and we're wondering what's going to be next. Look like every day it gets more dismal. Uh, I don't know when we'll be able to come back into the sanctuary. As of yesterday, I heard now they've put it off to probably the end of August or the 1st of September. And that brings about a, a lot of anxiety with the children of God. We're social people. We're used to worshiping. We're used to coming to church. I know it certainly has taken a toll on me. Uh, we're out of our our uh, comfort zone and what have you. We love to fellowship with one another. And to say another three months, I really didn't want to hear that. I hope that's not the case. I was sitting on the side of my bed last night around 3.34 in the morning praying. And I'm asking God for direction and, and to help his people and comfort us and give us his word. It, keeps me up night and day look like uh, because I want to do what's right in the sight of God and right by you all and comfort you. And so these things are happening. I'm going to say this, and this is my speculation. I'm not saying I have Bible for this. I'm speculating that this coronavirus is a precursory of what's going to happen during the time of the tribulation. I believe in my heart right now tonight that the pandemic that we're experiencing that has the whole world rocking and reeling is setting the human race, in, race up that it will be so easy to enter in this man of sin called the Antichrist. This pandemic is of such this virus, that they have not an answer for it yet. There's a lot of speculation. There's debate going back and forth. Who has a pill? Who has a vaccine? Some are already uh, upset. Well, I have to take a vaccination. Is there going to be a chip in the vaccination? Is, is there a tattoo? Is this the mark of the beast? And they're asking all kinds of questions and wondering what is going on right now. Personally, I don't think that which is coming up in the next few months or a year is the mark of the beast, but I think it's a precursory of it. It certainly has people where there will be conditioned to get out of the dilemma that they're in right now. Because right now, people want to go back to normality, and the longer we're in this dilemma, the more anxious people are going to be to get back to normality. And if anybody comes up with a remedy, a man that seems somewhat uh, advantageous, people will take it right away. That's my opinion. You can see that fear has a way of incarcerating you. And we want to go back to our norm. So if a vaccine comes on the scene or a, a medication comes on the scene, and they're already talking about a giving vaccine to everybody in the world, not just one country, but everybody in the world so the world can go back to its normality. And so that's being thrown out there. And they say it may come within a year, 18 months. Some say sooner, some say longer. They don't know if it's going to be deadly, if it's going to be a positive uh, force. Uh, will it work? It doesn't work. We just, they just don't know. 
And then we hear our politicians, uh, they're saying this is taking place to alter our election in November. And there's just all kinds of things being said. Our children now have just heard that the colleges, many of them that they apply to, they will not be able to uh, be in their classroom, in their dorms. They will have to be at their home and, and Zoom in and be online. And uh, it just everything is just altered. And, and so we're looking for a solution. And what it says to me is that the world is ready for somebody to come on the scene with a solution. And since it seems like no one has stepped up to the forefront, amen, I believe the adversary has somebody that's already alive on this planet right now that's going to step up with some type of solution, amen. And when they step up with it, people are gonna say peace, peace. We finally have a solution. We can go back to our normality. That with my in mind, I'm going to call you to the book of First Thessalonians chapter number five. Once again, I believe people are ready to hear a positive message about somebody with an answer. Those of us who are in the Bible-believing community and do not believe that revelation of Jesus Christ is an allegory, it's not just a story, but it's a reality that these things are going to take place. Revelation is not an allegory. These things will take place. They will fulfill Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, and, and, and Mark 13. You can read it for yourself. The Lord spoke about this, this time. We also know that something has to happen before the Lord comes back and sets up his own earthly kingdom. Therefore, before that takes place, the church that he, a man, has orchestrated for 2,000 years must be taken out of the land. Uh, I'm a pre-tribulationist because if I was post, I should be looking for trouble, and that would not be a comforting hope. I, I can't see how anyone could think going through the tribulation is going to be a comfort because when you read Revelation 6 through 19, there's not much comfort in there at all. It gets progressively worse as you read the chapters. And so the Lord, through the Apostle Paul, he told us that God has saved the church from the wrath to come. Also, let me interject, I believe that we are the last generation of the church. We are the people on earth fulfilling what God has said that there will be the dead in Christ who will rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, changed to meet him in the air and forever shall we be with the Lord. Now that's a comforting hope. Because to be with the Lord, to be in his presence, is fullness of joy. I might say we are somewhat anxious looking at, well, is it soon? How soon? When will it be? What is it going to be like? Well, it's going to happen so fast you won't even have to think about it. We will be in his presence. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, after the Apostle Paul had cleared up a misunderstanding about the saints that had already passed away, and he did that in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians 13 through 18, and he let us to know that there will come an event when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ would rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air and forever shall we be with the Lord. Then he said these words, comfort one another with these words. What comforts the child of God right now is the rapture. What's comforting me is that we're not going through the wrath. For he said in 1 Thessalonians, 
Thessalonians 1 and 10, he has saved us from the wrath to come. Amen. Now, in that fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, I want to bring out this particular thought. It says in verse 1, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. We know it's going to be imminent. There'll be uh, no announcement. Amen. We're going to be snatched away. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Let me share my thought with you, and I've been wrestling with this and meditating upon it. When they say peace and safety, I believe this pandemic that we are experiencing right now, and trust me, I understand we've had the Black Plague in the 13th and 14th century. We had the uh, Spanish flu uh, that we went through and 500 uh, million people, I mean 50 million to 100 million people passed away. We've gone through World War I, World War II. There's been numbers of pandemics and what have you. We've seen wars and rumors of wars and nations rising up. We've seen so many things and I'm sure the people that were living during those times, they probably were sure this must be the coming of the Lord. And now we look back in retrospect and he hadn't come yet. Now, what is our advantage? We're looking back at what took place in the last 2,000 years. Now, I will say to you, I am a believer that each creative day that God has given us it lasts six, excuse me, 7,000 years. If that be the case, and we take from the time Adam and Eve were created in the sixth day, and if that be the case, from the time they were created up until Jesus was born was 4,000 years. From Jesus' birth up until now, has been 2,000 years approximately. That's 6,000 years. We also know, follow my chronology now, the millennial that we're concerned, we know it's 1,000 years. This mention in Revelation chapter 20, it's 1,000 years, which gives you 7,000 years in the sixth creative day. As theologians, we believe that God is a God of order, and each day consists of 7,000 years. Well, that being the case, and this is 2020, and if we are at the 6,000th year of the sixth day, and there's a 1,000-year millennial, well, then how close must it be for us to be harvested? Because you can look at just by the time frame that it's been huh, almost 6,000 years. And we know the millennial will last seven, uh, excuse me, 1,000 years, which will make 7,000 years of man's creative day. On the seventh day, God rested. And we know the seventh day will usher us out into the eternity of eternities. And the seventh day will be when we read Revelation 21 and 22, and he makes everything brand new. When I think about that, and you've heard me say I've been a few places on the planet, and I've looked at how beautiful this planet is, I say sometime, God, how do you top the things that you've already created, because the, the few little things I've seen, the waterfalls, the, the forests, the, the, the other countries that we've flown over and the seas, you're a mighty God. But you say you're going to make everything brand new? Well, I sure look forward to being there when he makes everything brand new and no sin is nowhere around. I look forward to that. But nevertheless, back to my point on where we are right now. When you notice this, in verse number 
3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant, pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. I'm speculating that something's going to happen in the not too distant future. There's going to be a lull whereby they'll come up with something to conquer I tried to conquer this virus, at least squash it for a while. And things will come back to a relative, somewhat normal state. The economy may even grow again. People will feel comfortable. They'll be at ease. And all of a sudden, amen, it's like thunder before the storm. Then there will be sudden destruction. Amen. Because the only people that have a real eternal hope a real positive eternal hope is the church. Whatever transpires, amen, from the time that we leave here, and when we leave here, amen, then there will be a time where the Antichrist, which is represented as this white horse rider in Revelation, and certainly the world is ready for him. They're looking for a man of sin who has a plan. And we already know from the scriptures and what's going on even this month that the Pope and those of other religions have come together. They want a one world religion. Then we know that there's things going on, amen, in the hierarchy and the very wealthy, amen. They're looking forward to a one world government. They also are looking, amen, to uh, have it be of such that we uh, find ourselves in a place where this man of sin will be celebrated for his expertise in things. And he will exalt himself even above God. And uh, it will be unprecedented. If you keep your finger there in, Rev uh, excuse me, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, I want to show you something about that in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 6, our Bible reads like this. And it says in verse number one, Now I saw... When the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. Now keep in mind, Revelation 5 and 6, uh, excuse me, 4 and 5, the church is in heaven. Chapter number 6, we see things happening back down on earth. And then he says in verse number two, and I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown. He had a bow and he had a crown representing his no doubt kingship or authority was given to him and he went out conquering the conquer. If you notice, he doesn't have an arrow. He just has a bow. So we speculate he goes out in the name of peace. And I think that goes along with uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, peace, peace. He goes out in the name of peace. And everybody's going to gobble up, amen, his agenda. But then right after that, a second seal was opened. And when that second seal was opened, amen, it says it was a fiery red horse that went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Now, if you read on down, it gets progressively worse. So it starts off with peace and then it turns, amen, to carnage. But he's, he's got them uh, all set up with peace, peace. So let's go back to 
uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, and I'll try to bring out my thought there and bear with me. And you'll see in verse number 4, it says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness to that or this day should overtake you as a thief. You are sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others, but let us watch and be sober. Those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk are drunken at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, this is a very key point, this next verse. For God did not appoint us to wrath. If you continue to read Revelation 6, you will see that the wrath of God has been unleashed. But if you notice here, he's not appointed us to that wrath. I want to make the point again that we as the church, amen, are not appointed to the wrath of God or this seven-year period known as the tribulation. Amen. He has allowed us to escape all these things. I'm teaching this because I don't want we in the church to be ignorant. I want you to be aware. What's going on right now is a precursory. Amen. I believe there's going to be a lull. There may be even a semblance of some type of peace, but it's not going to last very long. Amen. Abruptly, we will be taken out of the land. Amen. And this one world government will be set up. There will be a cashless society. Amen. That's already in working. You're not going to be able to uh, use cash anymore. America will not be, amen, the America that you know. Because you can even see right now with 30 some odd million people being laid off, we're printing money uh, like we're printing it at an all time high and our economic structure is going to cave in and we're seeing that people are out of their norm and they're looking for an answer and America is not going to be a major player in this seven year period. On top of that, right today, we're also looking at something that most people are not paying much attention to. On tomorrow, May 14, 2020, it will be 72 years since Israel has become a nation. Amen. The Bible lets us to know the people that were living when Israel became a nation again, this generation will not pass until all be fulfilled. A generation has been speculated 40, 70, 120 years, what have you. But let's take 70 to 80. We're no doubt right in that window. And I can see that What we've noticed in the last couple of years with Jerusalem, as far as America is concerned, as being the capital of Israel, we see these things coming together. Amen. So surely, amen, God is getting ready to restore Israel to its national promise. Remember that Israel is the epicenter. This is all about Israel now. Amen. God's going to set them back up a second time, and he will rule from Jerusalem. All these things have to happen. Right now, Israel is a troublesome stone. It's going to really be a troublesome stone after we live. All the nations in the world are going to come against it, surround it, and God is the one who is going to intervene to rescue it. But right now, today, where are we? I believe that we're looking at our departure, that the Lord is soon to take us out. I don't know the day nor the hour, but I think we're going to be taken to be with him so these things can get started. The tribulation cannot start until the church is harvested. 
The white horse rider cannot ride until the church is caught up. And none of these other riders, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, cannot ride until the church is caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And forever shall we be with the Lord. At the same time, with all of what's going on, this pandemic, many are dying because of the coronavirus. God is going to keep us. He's going to protect us. Uh, and oh yes he is because he's going to have him a people that will be caught up when he shouts from heaven and the trumpet blows and then pandemonium will break out during the period of the tribulation we don't have time tonight to go through all the things that are going to transpire I'm just trying to comfort you at this very moment in time that our departure is right at the door. And so the Bible goes on to say in verse number eight concerning you and I, but let us who are of the day be sober, put it on the breastplate of faith, a love, a helmet, and the hope, the confident expectation of deliverance, salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. I don't believe he's appointed us to the tribulation. Once again, these pandemics, these things that are transpiring, the failing of revenue around the world and what have you, amen, he's going to sustain us. And once we're gone, then you're going to see a whole new world. It goes on to say, We've obtained salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he brings the reason why we have. He died for us. That whether we are awake, whether we are living on this planet in Carson, Los Angeles, etc., or sleep, have fallen asleep, have died in Christ, we should live together with him. Now, Therefore, comfort each other and build up one another or edify one another just as I'm doing. I hope all the rest of you are doing. I'm comforting to you to know that this pandemic is not the end of you. This is going to be, no doubt, the beginning of a new period of history. And I'm looking forward to the church being raptured at any given moment. Oh, yes, I'm looking forward to that. I believe these 2,000 years are about to expire, and the church, those of us who are alive and remain, shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, because faithful is he that calleth us, and he will do it. In the book of Philippians, chapter number 3, and the Bible says in verse number 20, we should be eagerly waiting for this. Amen. And I, I hope I'm comforting somebody because there's a lot of nervousness. What's going to happen? Are we going to have food to eat? Are we going to ever go back to school? Uh, church, we're getting ready to leave. It's time for us to leave this planet and to be with the Lord forever. We're about to be caught up because he promised he would do it. I will come again. He will receive us unto himself. Those of us who have the Holy Ghost have the guarantee from heaven that he will do it. He's guaranteed it. God's guarantee is the greatest guarantee in the universe. Hallelujah. It cannot be annulled. It's absolute. And we can stand on it and find our peace and hope in it. So the Apostle Paul says, amen, in verse number 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly will wait 
for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking for the Savior, glory, to come at any moment. Amen. I'm looking for him. And those who look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hallelujah. The next event for the church is the rapture, the catching away of the church to be with the Lord. Someone must fulfill the mystery that Paul wrote about, whether wake or sleep, we shall be changed from perishable to imperishable, from corruptible to incorruptible. It must take place because God has promised and guaranteed it. Verse number 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Hallelujah. The adversary doesn't want you, uh, the church people, to be excited about this. Uh, no wonder, amen, he's throwing a, a rock uh, in the midst of the churches, amen, where we can't come together because the Bible wants us to come together and encourage one another daily. And the adversary doesn't want us to encourage one another. He don't even want me to come back down here and, and preach to these pews. But I'm, I'm wrestling day and night. I'm in a warfare along with you because I want to be correct about what I'm telling you. I'm not preaching to you a false hope. This is solid Bible that I'm telling you. Amen. God cannot lie. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a joke. The Holy Ghost is not a joke. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost is the guarantee. The Holy Ghost is the power that will change us. Amen. From mortal to immortality. The Bible says he will transform our lowly body that will be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now this same Paul, I want you to pick this up. Amen. As he closes out this letter to the Philippians, you got to go to chapter 4. In chapter 4, you got to go to verse number 4. After he said all that, he says in verse number 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Hallelujah. You're telling me, Pastor Swansea, to rejoice. I'm saying I'm rejoicing because the church is about to be caught up and taken to be with the Lord. Why do I say that? Let your gentleness be known to all men. Why? The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. Rejoice because the Lord is near. Rejoice because he's about <coughs> to reappear. Hallelujah. Therefore, be anxious for nothing. Our nerves are being rattled by the things that are going on around us. But I want you to know, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, I find myself at three or four in the morning praying on the side of my bed, sitting in it. Amen. I find myself talking to God all throughout the day. And he said, do it with thanksgiving. Hallelujah. The flesh don't want to give him thanks, but my spirit is saying, hallelujah. The flesh, amen man is tantalized by the things that are befalling upon man. But my Holy Ghost is saying, thanksgiving, praise the Lord. Then he says, let your request be made known to God. Then the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If we can just believe that God is our refuge, God is our supply, that he is protecting us, he will not allow us to go through the tribulation. We will have a food on our table. There will be protection from the Almighty. He will set his angels in charge over us to protect 
protect us. Hallelujah. So we'll just keep on praising and thanking him. Hallelujah. He's guarding our hearts. And think about this, our minds. Amen. Your mind is something. A lot of things can run through the mind. Anxiety is in the mind. Fear is in the mind. Amen. We get frightful because something attacks the mind. Lord, help our mind. Help us to keep our mind stayed on thee. Hallelujah. Because if my mind is stayed on thee, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. But it takes an effort to keep your mind on the Lord. It takes an effort to think on the things of God. Surround yourself with some brothers and sisters. Call them up and encourage them with positive things. Hallelujah. As the old folk used to say, Lord, help me keep my mind stayed on you because a mind stayed on you can't do me no harm. Woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed on Jesus. I've been walking and talking with my mind stayed on Jesus. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. We have the mind of Christ and so we want to keep our minds on him and he will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I believe God is going to protect us in this hour and we don't know this hour is almost over. The Bible says in Revelations 3 and chapter number 3 and verse number 8, he says to the church <coughs> that's pleasing him, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. Thank God for a little strength. Amen. We're a small body of people on this planet. But you have kept my word and have not denied my name. <clears throat> I'm doing my level best to keep his word, and I'm sure enough holding on to the name of Yeshua. Amen. That name means everything to me, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know how many times I text back Maranatha because our Lord cometh. He says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I'm persevering right now. It took persevering to come down here this evening. You got to persevere over the works of the adversary. My fight is not with a man on the street. Our battle is not with flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. The, uh, the devil don't want me to encourage you to hold on to God's promises, but his promises are true, and for this we give his name the glory. Then he says, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. He's telling us, I'm going to keep you from from the tribulation period, that seven year period. He calls it the hour of trial. It's going to come up on the whole face of the earth. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction is going to come up on the whole world. If you read, amen, all four of these horse riders, it goes from bad to worse. Amen. From delusion, deception, amen, to killing, murder, <coughs> to hunger, amen. People, famine, starving to death, disease of all kinds, and the wrath of God has been unleashed. But I will keep you from that hour. Hallelujah. I'm not looking forward to trouble. I'm looking forward to being caught up to be with the Lord. I'm not looking forward to know who the white horse rider is. The white horse rider cannot be revealed until the church is caught up. The red horse rider cannot be revealed until the church is caught up. These things cannot happen until we're gone. So look up. 
Our redemption has drawn nigh. Hallelujah. Then he says these illustrious words. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Hallelujah. He's coming quickly. The Lord is coming quickly. And I'm looking for him at any moment. I can't think of any other thing to tell you, to comfort you at this hour. In the midst of what we're going through right now, the church is looking up. Our redemption is drawn nigh. Thank God. Hallelujah. He has equipped us. He has made us ready for his coming. Hallelujah. He has given us his name. He has washed us in his blood. He has filled us with his spirit. He has given us his word. He has protected us down through the years. He's not going to leave us now. Faithful is he that has called us. The devil is a lie. Jesus, hallelujah, rescues us from the calamities to come. Lord Jesus. Jesus, even so come, Maranatha, our Lord cometh. He's coming quickly, and the church, look up, be not dismayed. Hallelujah. We're getting ready to go home. We're going to be caught up. We're going to see him. We're going to meet him, and forever shall we be with the Lord. The Holy Ghost says amen. The Holy Ghost says amen. The Holy Ghost is our guarantee. The Holy Ghost guarantees our glorified body. The Holy Ghost guarantees that our citizenship is in heaven. The Holy Ghost guarantees we're going to be caught up in the moment and in the twinkling of an eye. The Holy Ghost guarantees we shall be transformed into his likeness. The Holy Ghost says we shall be with him forever. We got a right to have a positive confession in a negative world. We got a right to tell somebody Jesus saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. We got a right to tell somebody that Jesus is the deliverer, the savior of the world. Hallelujah. Right now in this Laodicean period, he's knocking on the door of somebody's heart. He's standing outside and he wants to get in. If any man will open up the door, he will come in and sup with you. Will somebody uh, invite him to come Come into their heart tonight and let God fill you with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm depending on the trustworthy word of God, the faithfulness of God. We're getting ready to see our Savior right now. We are the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we are certain, we are confident, we are sure that when he shall appear, we shall see him as he is faithful is he that called us and he will do it to God be the glory somebody say amen somebody be encouraged we're going home don't let this temporary situation water down your faith Fight the good fight of faith. Lay a hold to eternal life. Give God the glory that is due his name. Know he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'll be with you to the very end. No weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. God is going to take us to glory. He bought us with his own blood. He's filled us with his own power. And he's coming back to take us home. God has him a church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's go home church. Let's go home. Somebody pray with me. Even so come Lord Jesus to the next time. God bless you in Jesus name. Amen.
Thank you for watching today's live stream at Peace Apostolic Church, pastored by Bishop Howard A. Swansea, Jr. We pray that you enjoyed watching and that you were touched by the Spirit of the Lord. Feel free to join us in fellowship at 21224 South Figueroa Street in Carson, California, 90745. Catch our Sunday worship services at 11.45 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. and our Wednesday Bible classes at 12.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Peace Apostolic Church, the soul-saving station. Until next time, peace and blessings.